Welcome everybody to the Brooks Memorial Library for uh, Friday night. Uh, happy that you are here, middle of our winter. I guess we're getting started <laughs> early this year. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Tom Wessels now. Tom is the author of the book Forest Forensics, a field guide to reading the forest and landscape. And we uh, happen to have, I think, six of Tom's uh, books in the collection, and they all uh, go out all the time. So. Uh, um, Please buy a book, but you, if, if you don't feel like buying a book, we do have the, uh, the copy of the collection for you. And if it goes out of print, we'll still have it. So, um, Tom is the founding director of uh, the master's degree program in conservation biology at Antioch University in uh, Keene. He's the current chair of the Center for Whole Communities and a former chair of the Robert and Patricia Switzer Foundation. Uh, as an ecological consultant to the Rainforest Alliance Smartwood Green Certification Program, he helped to draft green certification assessment guidelines for forest operations in the northeastern United States and adjacent Canada. He's conducted landscape level workshops throughout the U.S. for every 30 years. His other books include The Granite Landscape, Untamed Vermont, and The Myth of Progress. Please welcome Tom Wessels. Uh, I'm sort of, sort of surprised to see such a huge group here. I mean, I've done this talk so many times around here, I'm surprised people keep coming, but <laughs> thank you for coming tonight. Um, as you'll see, for anyone who hasn't seen the slideshow before, we're going to look at the type of evidence uh, we can use when we're wandering out in the woods to interpret past disturbance histories. And tonight we'll be focusing on how to interpret past agricultural use in now forested landscapes and also look at how we can interpret uh, logging activity in the landscape. Um, there's quite a bit of information, so if anyone has questions while the image is up, just, you know, sort of shout it out and we'll deal with it right there, although there'll be ample time for questions at the end. I will have some questions for you They won't be rhetorical. Uh, it just happens the first two are the most challenging, then after that they're really easy. It's either a yes or a no. So if you're bold, even if you don't get it correctly, you'll have given us the right answer because we'll know it's the other one. Um, but in any case, uh, I'll also, I'm going to stay a longer period of time on the first slide because I want to set the historical stage and then we'll start moving through them more quickly. So I think I will get to the slide projector, get that on, we'll get going. <clears throat> a bit longer on than the other ones. This is a, a, a slide from Reading the Forested Landscape. It's a very coarse level view of the forested regions of New England. And um, in this, basically, I, I broke the forest up into three major sections. Southern New England down here in gray, uh, central New England where we are today in white and then northern New England up here in gray and basically the southern section here is the northern reaches of the temperate deciduous forest biome that is a forested biome characterized by broadleaf trees that drop their leaves in the winter uh, that biome stretches down into the Gulf states out across the Mississippi River throughout much of its range was uh, historically dominated by American chestnut today uh, more commonly dominated by species of oaks and we will get into talking about chestnut tonight. Um, up here, northern New England is sort of the southern reaches of the coniferous boreal forest biome. This is a biome dominated by trees such as black spruce and larch uh, that goes way on up into Labrador and then out across Canada. And then in between is this section here, which is often called the transition forest, because it's a sort of a transition zone between these two major forested biomes in the eastern United States. So, if you're interested in biotic diversity, it's a great place to be because of this mixing, for example, we get about 140 species of trees and shrubs that find either their northern or southern range limits in here. So uh, it boosts a lot of biotic richness because of that mixing. But it's also an area of New England that's distinguished from southern and northern by its cultural history. This is the area that was really the focal point of sheep fever. And if uh, no one's ever heard about sheep fever, I can assure you the, the sheep were quite fine. They, they weren't feverish at all. The, the fever was a wool-growing mania that's been compared to a religious fanaticism because it was sort of really the first major market farming opportunity for people around here. So up until about 1810, the farms around here were pretty much self-reliant farms. Uh, people would have had a, a few oxen, you know, maybe a dairy cow, a few sheep, some pigs. Uh, but not huge amounts of livestock, just enough to provide them with their needs. Um, and then if they had some surpluses, those would be sold. But with sheep fever, all of a sudden, there becomes the potential for now raising large flocks of sheep and selling the wool and actually making a lot of money off of that process. 
Um, there were three things that sparked sheep fever in this region. The first is Napoleon going to war against the Portuguese in 1809. Now it might sound strange that a war in Portugal is going to dramatically impact the landscape here, but the Portuguese had bred the special breed of sheep called the Merino. And the Merino was not just a hardy animal, it had a very ample fleece. Uh, its wool, I guess the main feature was, the wool made very fine woolens that were not scratchy. So everyone wanted Merino wool, which the Portuguese liberally exported. But they had an embargo on the sheep itself. They didn't want really anyone to get a hold of that because then they would be competitive. And they wanted to have a lock on the Merino wool market. Well, when Napoleon marched into Portugal, the embargo fell. And it just happens that the US consulate to Portugal at the time was a Vermonter named William Jarvis, who lived up in Weathersfield, Vermont, just a little bit north of here on the Connecticut River, and he brought in the first 4,000 Merino sheep. Um, two years after that, in 1812, we went to war with Britain. One result of that war was tariffs went up on all imported woolens, giving a market advantage to anyone who could produce woolen textiles here. And then two years after that, in 1814, the power loom was invented, which now allowed mass industrial production of textiles. And with all the water power coming out of our central New England hills, this quickly grew to become one of the major woolen manufacturing regions of the world. Um, now to give you an idea how dramatic the changes are that come with this, when Jarvis brought over his first 4,000 sheep in 1810, about 25% about of the land was open agricultural land as of that time. Um, by 1840, those 30 years later, those 4,000 Reno sheep swelled to 4 million in central New England. And basically, below 2,000 feet, pretty much 80% of the landscape around here was deforested. So we're looking at about 50% of this area in white in the map being clear cut of its forest in a 30 year time frame to make way for pastures for sheep. So a very, very dramatic event. Now, in their zeal to grow as much wool as possible, a lot of the hillside pastures were dramatically. Uh, it overgrazed, eroding, market dynamics started changing in the 1840s, for example, cotton becoming much more popular, and there was a major sort of bust to this whole sheep growing industry. Um, and between the 1840s and the 1850s, there was an incredible migration out of this region of people. Vermont lost close to one half its human residents in a 10 year period, and they went out to the Ohio Valley via rail and canal. If they had sheep, they took the sheep flocks with them, and then the wool was brought back to be processed in all the mill towns that grew up around here. So a very, very dramatic story. Now, the evidence that remains of that period are the stone fences we see out in the woodlands today around here. Uh, pretty much all those stone fences we see out there date to the sheep fever period. Now, many people think that um, as the landscape was first opened up, uh, farmers were building stone fences. And actually, that's not the case. They, uh, wood fencing was a much preferred form of fencing, split rail, zigzag fencing. Farmers could put up 10 times as much a day as stone. It was actually more practical in keeping animals in pastures or out of hay fields or crop fields. It's only with the associated massive deforestation associated with sheep fever that now wood comes in short supply and farmers now have to go back to stone dumps, bring back the stone and start building up stone fencing. Now, in the region of central New England, it's estimated we have 125,000 woodland stone fences. That means if we line that all up and wrap the equator five times, it would stretch more than halfway to the moon. I've calculated if we piled all that stone, it'd be about seven times as massive as all the pyramids in Egypt. And yet, pretty much all that work was done in a period of 30 to 40 years. Now, if uh, this part of the world was on the Mediterranean, you can bet those stone fences would be the eighth wonder of the world. But they're not. It's just a good part of our own history. Um, and another good part of that history is that um, we recovered pretty well around here. In many areas of the world where there was sheep overgrazing, um, forests did not return. So there's a lot of areas in the Mediterranean, places like Iceland, where overgrazing of sheep took place and forests did not come back. Here, it came back quite robustly. So this is a, a view of uh, Mount Monadnock from Pitcher Mountain over in Stoddard, New Hampshire. These two uh, summits are linked by the Monadnock Sunapee Greenway, a hiking trail that if you hike through today, you would trip across stone wall after stone wall after stone wall because pretty much the majority of the landscape we're looking at in the slide, other than the upper thousand feet of Mount Monadnock, was pretty much open pasturage for sheep. And you can see how, how well it has come back as well as all of our forest lands right around here. Now, 
this is uh, another area in, in central New England. This is in, in Ponell, Vermont. Um, I used to know the people that had this farm, and I've hiked this ridge system pretty extensively, and it's crisscrossed by stone walls, in some cases rising up to the ridge top. And when you get in those sections of the ridge top, you can often find broad expanses of bedrock where overgrazing by sheep eroded the soil right down to the basement material. Um, and this slide also shows the three major reasons the land was open for agricultural activity. So one reason was to put into crop fields like this area right here, that, that cornfield, where the ground was tilled every year, seeds were sown to grow crops. The second reason was to put it into hay field like this area right over here uh, to grow forage for livestock in the winter. And then the third reason, of course, was pasturage like this area right up here. And that's not just a pasture, that's an overgrazed pasture. And I can tell that by the type of vegetation that is uh, moving into that site. Now, with good pasture management, uh, very intensive short-term grazing and rotation of, of livestock, you can keep a pasture productive for centuries. But around here, if a pasture is overgrazed, it's going to, on its own, revert back to forest. It goes through four pretty classic successional phases in that process. And we'll go through them in a bit because they, they offer us some good evidence to work with. Um, for looking at how to interpret former pastured histories. Now this is probably what it looked like around here as of about 1840. Getting near the peak of the sheep fever craze, about 80% of the landscape open, about 20% being left in woodlot. And these woodlots were critical for the growing of fuel wood. Now back in the early 1800s when the sheep fever was occurring, we were still globally in little ice age climates. And also with the massive deforestation, there was, quite about, there was quite a bit of radiational cooling on winter nights. So generally, nighttime temperatures back then were going about 20 degrees colder than we see today. So I'd like you to think about the lowest temperature you've seen on your thermometer in the wintertime, drop it about another 20 degrees, and then imagine, imagine living in an uninsulated farmhouse, and your source of heat is an open fireplace hearth. So on those open fireplace hearths, they would burn fires 24 hours a day through the heating season. So generally around here, small farmhouses were going through about 25 cords of wood a year, big ones up to about 60. Um, and you have to imagine that's all being cut with axes because they didn't have uh, saws at that point in time. Um, so an incredible amount of wood being used for heating, which meant there just, was, just wasn't enough anymore for wood fencing. And so we see as zigzag fencing starts to decay away, it becomes replaced by, by stone fencing. Now back then it was sheep that were creating uh, a lot of these landscape changes, and yet until fairly recently, if we were thinking about uh, market farming in a state like Vermont, we'd be thinking of, of dairy farming. And actual uh, market dairy farming did not get started in the region until about the time of the Civil War. By that point in time, rail had linked up all the urban centers that had grown up in this region, allowing rural dairy farmers to get their dairy products into those urban centers via rail. And so around the Civil War, uh, we move into a, a phase now of new market farming around dairy. But again, whether it's cows uh, or sheep, if you get overgrazing, um, the pasture is going to start having plants move into it that set the stage for it to grow back to forest. And uh, so here's the very first sort of phase of what an overgrazed pasture looks like. What you'll notice is the grasses have been reduced and they're being replaced by herbaceous plants whose leaves grow at ground level in a radial fashion. That growth form is called a basal rosette. And so when you start seeing the grass being reduced and basal rosettes moving in, that's the first sign that the pasture is being overgrazed. And so we have uh, basal rosettes like that hawkweed there, there's yarrow, there's pussy toes, um, there's some sheep sorrel in here. I should mention all four of those species are not native to New England. They're from the old world. And uh, in fact, you know, the majority of plants we see in our lawns that have this growth form, like dandelions or plantains, are also from the old world. This was a, a growth form very much selected for in old world pastured landscapes because if you're a plant and you're gonna survive in an actively grazed pasture, you have basically one of three strategies you can employ. You can be armed with spines or thorns to ward off the mouth of a munching animal, or you can be unpalatable like milkweed. But if you don't have either of those options, you're probably, if you're gonna survive, you're gonna survive because you hug the ground and therefore can stay out of the, the, the mouth of a, a cow, a sheep, or a goat. So the reduction of the grasses allows these basal rosettes to move in, 
which are adapted to survive in these landscapes because they can stay uh, out of the way of munching teeth. Now, in amongst these basal rosettes, we now start getting little areas of exposed soil is the thatch of the grass has been removed with the removal of the grasses. That allows the next group of plants to move in, which are the coarse weeds. And these grow upright uh, because they're unpalatable, like milkweed, um, or maybe they're armed with spines like the thistle. And once again, the majority of plants we see in the region today that have spines or thorns are actually exotic species, again, from the old world. Again, many of them uh, being selected for these strategies in, in old world pastured landscapes. Now, many of these coarse weeds, like the thistle, have very tiny windblown seeds. So it's not difficult for the seed to get in the pasture, but to establish those seeds really need to get down towards mineral soil. If they landed on a thick thatch of grass, they just don't have enough stored energy to germinate and get a root down that material, through that material and establish. So the moving into the basal rosettes creates germination sites for these coarse weeds to move in. And of course, um, not all of them are exotic, so one species that comes in this phase commonly is, is the milkweed. And you'll notice it has a, a, a sizable seed, um, and that's because the original habitat of the milkweed before the British got here were uh, intervale prairie-like ecosystems that lined our major waterways. So um, my wife, Marcia, her dad still lives down in Connecticut, and she's going down there pretty much weekly now. So when she takes off from Westminster, Vermont, to go down to Connecticut, down on Interstate 91, as she enters the Pioneer Valley of uh, Massachusetts, she drives past Northfield, then past Greenfield, then Deerfield, then Hatfield, then Springfield, and then she enters Enfield, Connecticut. And it's not just an accident that all those towns lining the Connecticut River, the Pioneer Valley, and in field, because that was the site of Native American agriculture on those nice, rich alluvial floodplains free of rocks. And uh, as garden plots became unproductive and were abandoned, the Native people would just burn them and keep them in grasses because eventually the soils would be rejuvenated. It was a lot less work to open up sod and start new garden plots than have to remove you know, young trees and shrubs. So basically about 600 years of agriculture and then associated use of fire in, um, around our major rivers pushed the forest margin back, um, creating these, these intervale prairie-like ecosystems and that would have been the native habitat of the milkweed around here, which has the bigger seeds, so it can colonize within the turf of a, a prairie-like system. Now, in areas where these coarse weeds grow somewhat densely, they act as nurseries for the invasion of, of berry-producing shrubs, the next phase in this process. However, for those shrubs to establish, their seeds have to land a clump of coarse weeds. And as we're going to see, and so the way the seeds get out there is they're brought out by wildlife, like. Uh, foxes, coyotes, raccoons, more likely uh, berry-eating birds like cedar waxwings, uh, starlings, uh, robins, things like that. But as we're going to see, a lot of the shrubs that come in this third phase are exotic species that are armed with spines or thorns. So species like the Japanese barberry. You can't see the spines in this, this image, but anyone that's worked with barberry knows how spiny it is. Uh, or the hawthorn with its uh, you know, fairly noticeable big thorns. And you might think that plants that have this armature could invade and actively graze pasture all on their own, and yet they can't. They need to have their seeds lodged in a clump of coarse weeds because they need to be hidden from view their first year of growth. Um, because it's going to take about that long to develop the requisite woodiness to uh, ward off the mouth of a, a cow, a sheep, or a goat. So if a, a plant like this hawthorn grew up out in the open, the odds are it's going to be browsed out of existence that first year. But if it seeds lucky enough to land a clump of coarse weeds where it can be hidden from view, it gives them the chance to establish. So just as the basal rosettes create conditions that allow the coarse weeds to move in, the coarse weeds now act as nurseries for the invasion of berry producing shrubs, which include a whole host of roses, most commonly multiflora rose, but in this case, rugosa rose. And then finally, these shrubs um, act as nurseries for the invasion of trees. So here we have a, a clump of barberry and rose out of which is growing a white ash. And it's very unlikely that there was, this was the only white ash seed to fall on this pasture. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that you know, seeds fell back there, maybe there, maybe there. We don't see trees in those sites because they grew up in the open and were browsed and killed off. But this seed was lucky enough to land in this, you know, spiny, 
thorny cluster of shrubs where it was protected from the dairy cows in this pasture and now has reached a height, even though they're still in this pasture, that they can't get at it. So that's the way that uh, uh, an overgrazed pasture just works its way back to forest and eventually um, if the farm's not doing well, the pasture's you know, losing productivity, eventually the animals get pulled out and it's just abandoned to grow back to forest at that point. Now, it's this third and fourth phase, the shrub and tree phase, that start giving us some good evidence to work with. This is one of the, uh, the woody plants that comes in this third phase, and um, this is a close-up of one of its uh, relatives. Um, I took this photograph in the summer of 1976. It was the year that I came back to New England after doing my graduate work in Colorado, and I wandered into this uh, overgrazed pasture in the town of Putney, and came across this dramatically bonsai shrub. Um, it was only about 16 inches tall. The leaves were about a half an inch long. I'm pretty good at identifying uh, plants, and I was baffled by what this was. Uh, I was looking at it for five minutes, trying to figure out what species of woody plant it was, and I couldn't tell until I uh, pried apart the very deformed outer branches and could see some well-formed twigs down inside of this thing and on those twigs I saw that the buds had a white woolly coating on them and I instantly realized I was looking at an apple tree. But an apple, I figured, had been pretty heavily deformed by browsing and I wanted to figure out for how long. So I went home and I got a handsaw and I cut this specimen. It had about a one and a quarter inch trunk. The annual growth rings were much too close together to count with the naked eye, so I took a section off, went home, sanded it down, and then with a, a hand lens, found out that that 16 inch high apple was 36 years of age. Now it was, it was actually 10 years older than I was at the time. Now, since then I've been realizing how tenacious these, these apples can be in pastures like this. I, I don't cut them anymore, I'll use an increment bore. I haven't actually cored one in a while, but um, probably, it was probably almost 20 years ago, I got a core off a bonsai apple in New York State, only about three feet in height, of 94 years. So my guess is that somewhere out in a pastured landscape today, we may have uh, basically bonsai apples three feet in height that may be over a century in age, and they have withstood sustained browsing pressure through that time. So my respect for the tenacity of this species has just skyrocketed with that realization. And uh, um, and you know, I really, it's, I, I don't know, I don't know any other woody plant can do this. They don't have, you know, any. Um, chemical defenses, they're not unpalatable, they don't have spines or thorns, but this ability to hold on like this under intense grazing is probably something they developed, again, in old world pasture landscapes, because that seems to be their strategy of how to survive in a pasture. If they can get in, they'll often maintain themselves until eventually the pasture gets so unproductive, the animals are pulled out and then uh, it's abandoned, and then these apples eventually start growing up to become trees. And if, you, and if you go into a site like this one that had a lot of apples in it, at the time it was abandoned, about 30 years later, if you walk into a forest like this, you're going to encounter what I call weird apples. And I wish I'd come up with a much more respectful term than weird, but um, it was my first book. The editors didn't touch it. It's now in there, so I sort of have to use it, I guess. But what a weird apple looks like, um, from basically waist height on down, it, it usually will be multiple trunked sometimes single trunk, but in either case it's going to have rounded knobs in the lower section of the trunk, and right at ground level there's going to be a dense, dead apron of branches skirting the tree. And then about three feet above ground it grows up as a struggling apple tree in the forest. Uh, whenever I see a, a tree like that in our woodlands around here, I know I'm standing in an overly, uh, formerly overly grazed pasture. It's the only way they can get to form like that. Now, further south, as we get down to Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, where there's very dense deer herds, I'm guessing deer could maybe do that to apple, but up here it's, it's only going to happen through overgrazed pastures. Now the problem with weird apples is they're becoming exceedingly rare. In fact, the last time I ever saw one was probably about seven years ago. And my guess is I might not see any anymore because our forests have matured to the point that these apples, which are slow growing, get covered up in the canopy, they're shade intolerant, so they die and they, they decay away. So. Um, they're, a, they're sort of an ephemeral piece of evidence. But luckily, another woody plant that's every bit as good as weird apples is the other wood, woody plant in the slide, the common juniper. Um, there's only four sites around here where you're going to find robust populations of common juniper. Um, 
One would be um, in the crevices of rock outcroppings, like this glacial boulder. So we got a one, two, three clumps of juniper growing out of those crevices. So sometimes on rock outcroppings, you can find a lot of common juniper. A second site are on very dry sandy soils, carpeted in uh, dry-sided mosses. So here we have a bunch of star moss with uh, a young juniper there growing out of it, some clumps of reindeer lichen, a few wisps of grass. A third site you can find it, uh, which is fairly recent, are in power line cuts that are herbicided. And then finally, the last site you'll find it in robust populations are overgrazed pastures. And the reason is that, the, that it's relegated to these sites in robust populations is that juniper is very slow growing in its early years and it's intolerant of being shaded, so it can only establish in sites where herbaceous plants can't grow up and over it. So that's not going to happen in the crevice of a rock outcropping. It's not going to happen in this uh, mat of moss that just has a little bit of grass coming up. It's not going to happen in a power line cut where they herbicide, with the herbicides killing those herbaceous plants. And it's not going to happen in a pasture where livestock won't eat the unpalatable juniper, but they'll browse right or graze right around it, giving each juniper the chance to establish. So if you're out and about, and you're not under a power line, and you're not on a rock outcropping, and you're not standing in a, a mat of moss, but you see a lot of juniper, you can be very confident you're standing in an overgrazed pasture or an abandoned overgrazed pasture. So it's, it's very good evidence of that. <clears throat> now, this, this slide is of the same pasture as the previous slide, but a different vantage point. And this is um, about three years after the dairy cows were pulled out of this pasture, it's just becoming unproductive. Um, and what I'd like you to look at here is the diverse array of trees that have been nursed along by the nurse shrubs in this pasture. And juniper makes a very good nurse shrub because as it ages, it sort of hollows out in its center and trees can seed in there. Now you can't see it from this slide, but if you were to walk into this site at the time the photo was taken, you'd be able to see red maples growing out of these nurse shrubs, sugar maples, paper birch, yellow birch, black birch, uh, red oak, beech, white ash, black cherry, a, a very diverse array of trees. Now, if I walk into a, a young woodland, you know, a, a forest that's, you know, 50 years of age or less, <clears throat> that I know uh, followed pasture abandonment, the very first thing I look at is I just look up at the canopy. If it's very diverse, like this forest is going to be a lot of different species present, that's telling me that that uh, pasture was abandoned um, after it had been overgrazed a good amount of time and developed nurse shrubs. Because a lot of our trees have this strategy um, where uh, they forego or have very limited seed production for a number of years in a row. So a lot of our large seeded trees do this like oaks and ash, sugar maple, beech, um, our, our cone bearing trees do this. Um, so let's say if we're talking about red oaks, and actually it is, a, it is a mass year for red oaks right now. If you go out in the woodlands, you're going to see a lot of acorns in the ground, where previously, the previous years, you would see very, very few. So the way this works, all the oaks within a bioregion, and a bioregion can be pretty large, it can be as big as the southern half of New England, <clears throat> sort of coordinate the release of acorns um, on a certain year. The ensuing years in between, uh, energy that could be going into acorn production is being stored as starch in the tree's root system. And then during the mast year, which could be two years later, four years later, six years later, eight years later, um, they all come forth with this huge increase in acorn production. So a lot of our trees do this. So if you have nurse shrubs in place during these various masting years for these various species of trees, they can seed into those nurse shrubs. So maybe, you know, one year it's maple moving in, the next year white ash, the next year beech and red oak. And after a number of years, you're going to get a diverse array of trees coming up out of those nurse shrubs. However, if a pasture is abandoned before it gets to the nurse shrub stage, it usually gets carpeted in, you know, maybe one or two species of seeds and comes up into much more like monoculture-like stands than these very diverse stands. So the presence of nurse shrubs in this behavior of these trees that have these, these mast years versus lack of nurse shrubs gives rise to different forest types at the time of abandonment. Now, the first question for you is, um, and this is not the rhetorical one, remember these are the first, the first, the first ones are the hardest ones, why have a, so many of tree species developed this strategy of having very little seed production over years in a row and then having this really ample amount of seed production in the mast year? Yes? Oh. Okay, that's it. 
So if you think about it, it is a bit of a gamble. Let's say if you're a red oak and you've been storing up energy for five years, the next year's going to be a mast year. Uh, but that winter you get ripped apart by an ice storm, you get taken down a wind event or a logging event, you've lost all that reproductive capacity. But the reason uh, so many of our trees do this, it's a strategy to thwart seed predators. Um, so what is the major consumer of acorns? It's not bear or squirrels. It's not turkeys. Not deer. Not, it is. It's a species of insect. It's the acorn weevil. Now I think many of you have seen evidence of the acorn weevil. If you're out in woodlands when there aren't many acorns being produced, every single one you pick up off the ground you see a nice clean hole in the shell. How many people have seen that? That's the exit hole of the adult weevil. So the weevils are in the canopy laying eggs and acorns in the summertime. By the time we're getting into August, before the acorns are even falling, um, the larvae have hatched out and the, the acorn viability has already been compromised. Now the, the larvae only eats a, a, a certain amount of the meat of the acorn, the bulk of it still remains in there. So when those acorns come down, there's still plenty of food left for all the vertebrates to get at them. But the viability of the acorn's already been compromised. So if all the oaks in a region can suppress acorn production, um, that for a number of years is going to very much depress the weevil population. And then during the mast year, they can overwhelm them. Um, and, you know, they have a very high success rate during those times. So, um, you know, that's, 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 you know, the reason that so many trees have developed this strategy. How now, how do they, how do they, they all really the same? Well, we, I, we don't really know. There is some speculation that there, there may be chemical communication. The, the, the speculation around that has been derived from the fact that, for example, the oaks on Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, and mainland New England, even though they're in the same growing climate, are on different masting schedules. And there's some sense they might be far enough apart they can't chemically communicate. Um, now, it might seem strange of trees chemically communicating, but actually, um, when we were having our really big gypsy moth outbreaks here, for anyone that was living around here around 81, you can remember what it looked like across the river in one task. It was just completely defoliated. Well, research at Penn, researchers at Penn State University wanted to figure out how quickly oaks could increase the tannin level in their leaves. Tannins are molecules that bind to protein, um, making them indigestible. So it's a, it's a chemical uh, herbivore deterrent. Now, there were no gypsy moths down in that part of Pennsylvania at the time, so they had to develop a, an experiment. So they had a group of experimental oaks and a group of control oaks. Uh, from each group, they took leaves off those trees at the start of the, the experimental period to get a baseline tannin level. In both groups, the amount of tannin was pretty much the same. <clears throat> then in the experimental trees, they climbed up into those trees and started ripping up the leaves in little tiny pieces as if they were being eaten by gypsy moth larvae. And from those experimental trees, each day they'd take off an intact leaf, check its tannin levels, and sure enough, once they started that treatment, the tannin really started going up in those leaves. But being good researchers, they had a control group. And those control trees that weren't having their leaves ripped up, just having one leaf removed each day, they were spiking their tannin levels at the same time. And the control group was a, a good distance away across a highway system. So they knew it wasn't any communication through underground root grafting to neighboring nearby oaks. So they figured, gee, when we're ripping up these leaves, we're probably releasing some sort of plant hormone. Uh, and they did further work and they pinned it down. It's jasmonic acid on oaks. If you rip up oak leaves, jasmonic acid's released. If neighboring oaks pick that up through their stomatophores, it's a cue to boost tan levels uh, to get ready for, for munching insects. So um, we do know there is some communication there, and the speculation is it might be with this masking as well. And I, I have to admit, I haven't kept up in the research to know if anyone has pinned that down or has, has proven that, but that's a speculation. Now, this was um, the 2001 mast year for white pine around here. Our last mast year was 2009. Uh, so there's an eight-year period between those two mast years for the white pine. Um, those cones fell out in our uh, woodland in Westminster, Vermont. I didn't rake them like that. That's just the density they fell down in. And of course, in between those two mast years, hardly any cones were being produced at all. Um, so, really, you know, dramatic, dramatic increase in seed production here. Now, eventually, if you get a pasture that has a lot of common juniper in it, eventually the trees that have nursed through it will grow up over it. If their crowns touch, the shade produced will kill the juniper, um, because it's shade intolerant, 
But luckily, uh, juniper has really quite rot-resistant branches, so skeletal remains can be visible on big specimens up to 50 years after they die. But after about 75 years of forest development after pasture abandonment, uh, weird apples, common junipers will be gone. So that means any pastures abandoned prior to World War II, this evidence is not going to be there. And since the bulk of our pastures were already abandoned by that time, we're going to have to look for longer lasting evidence. So what I go for next are what I call pasture trees. And a pasture tree has two attributes. The first is it's an open grown tree that grew by itself out in the open. And because of that could spread its limbs out horizontally rather than uh, sort of extending its trunk and racing up into the canopy of the forest. And the second attribute is that it's not on a fence line or growing out of a stone wall. In fact, this hemlock here is growing at the top of a small hill that is surrounded on all four sides by stone and wire fencing. So when I see trees like this out in the middle of what, what were once open landscapes, I know I'm not looking at a crop field where the roots of this tree in the shade would make crop production not that viable. I know I'm not looking at a hay field where, again, the, the shade and litter fall of this tree would dramatically reduce grass production under there, but I am looking at a pasture where trees like this would have been left to shade livestock on hot summer afternoons. Now, the problem <clears throat> with pasture trees as evidence is because they put so much energy initially into growing out horizontally, they can never really attain the height of the forest eventually that grows up around them. So they can get swallowed in the canopy, and if they're not shade taunt like this hemlock, they're going to die and then decay away. So, in fact, if we could have ventured out in the woodlands around here, let's say, 70 years ago, we would find more specimens of these trees than we see today. And eventually, this also is an ephemeral part of our landscape. Um, unless we get another period of pasture development and then abandonment, um, what we're going to see around here is all these large old trees, legacy trees, are eventually going to disappear. And people walking the woodlands, you know, a couple hundred years from now will not see anything like this. Um, so, you know, they are sort of uh, ephemeral. So if you don't have one, it doesn't necessarily mean you don't have a pasture. Uh, you know, it just means you might have to look further. And so then I start looking for fencing. If I get wire fencing like I have here, it tells me a number of things. One, if it's barbed wire, uh, I'm looking at a pasture that most likely held dairy cows, possibly horses, but not sheep in heavy fleece. Uh, sheep can't feel the barbs of barbed wire. They can get tangled in it and injured. So generally a smooth mesh wire fencing was used for sheep. Uh, secondly, wire like this did not become commercially produced until 1874. So now I know that that landscape was worked after 1874. And then finally, if the wire is attached to small trees or fence posts, these are, you know, things maybe three inches or less in size. Then by seeing on which side of the tree or post the wire has been strung, I can tell on which side the pasture was. So I want you to think about this. If you're, if you're nailing up wire onto small trees or posts, are you going to attach it on the side facing the pasture or on the side facing away from the pasture? Facing the pasture, absolutely. So if livestock are leaning into the wire, <clears throat> they're pushing it into the post of the tree, not away from it where they could dislodge it and knock it down. Now, if you're putting wire on big trees with, where you can anchor big nails, you can put it on, I guess, whatever size convenient. But if you're putting it up on small stock, you know, run it on the side facing the pasture. Now, the red maple that this wire is attached to is six inches in diameter when the photograph was taken. Uh, it's obviously a slower growing maple. Normally at that size, they'd have smooth bark. This bark is already roughing, roughening up. And um, I know that it takes at least 25 years but before the wood of a growing tree will encapsulate the wire within it. So I'm pretty confident when this wire was strung up, the, the maple was probably only about three inches of size. And because of that, it means the pasture layout where we are, and actually the backside was actually a area that uh, was a woodlot that was always wooded. This is actually on a property boundary, this fence. Now, here's another classic view in our woodlands, a stone fence running out through the landscape. <clears throat> in this case, no barbed wire associated with it. So whenever I see a stone fence that doesn't have barbed wire, um, I'm starting to think, okay, this may be related to the first period of land abandonment in the 1840s and 1850s. Um, now, when I get a stone fence like this, I'm going to walk the fence line to see if I can find many small fist-sized stones. Any fence that has a good number of small fist-sized stones indicates that it once abutted a crop field. Because um, crop fields are the only sites that both generate 
and necessitate the removal of small rocks. So any of you that have vegetable gardens on glacial till soils, if you turn your vegetable garden over each year, you know, you go out in the spring, you start turning it over, and all the rocks you picked out the year before have been replaced by a new cohort. You might think they're reproducing, uh, but that's not it. It's just that in your garden plot that lacks the roots of perennial vegetation, like grass or shrubs or trees, freeze and thaw cycles can leverage rocks up to the surface. Now, we don't have to go out in our lawns and pick up rocks. Rocks don't surface out of our lawns. They don't surface on their own out of forest soils because in those sites, you've got all these perennial roots in the ground, which stitch everything in the soil into a unit. So if the ground freezes and expands and then thaws and drops back down, rocks stay in place. But in a garden or a crop field that lacks those roots, um, imagine the frost going down the ground, latching onto a rock. The frost continues to go down, which means the ground's going to be expanding, so the rock starts getting lifted up. And what people don't realize is, in the spring, when the thaw comes out of the ground, the thaw works from the bottom up, not the top down. Because once we get down below that frost zone, we're down into soil temperatures around here, about 55 degrees Fahrenheit. There's an incredible heat reservoir down there. So as the winter abates and the cold can't get down as far anymore, that thaw zone starts working up. The pocket that held the rock thaws, maybe collapses a bit while the rock is still held in the frozen ground. And when the rock is released, it can't make it to its original position. And so in this way, they're ratcheted up about an inch a year. When they get up to the surface, they get picked out. And if there's already a stone fence protecting that crop field, that's where those rocks are going to end up. They're going to end up in its construction, or they might be dumped against it or dumped in the corners. Uh, as you get over into New Hampshire, where you find larger granite boulders dropped by the glaciers, a very classic wall over there, crop field wall, is two stacks of large granite boulders a few feet apart and then infilled in the middle with small stone. That's a very, very sort of classic wall. So if you walk this wall, you'll never see any small rock. So that means this site was never a crop field. So that leaves us with the possibility that, that this was either pasture land or hay field. What is your guess based on looking at the slide? Pasture, right. And what's the evidence of that, that was pasture? Because you're correct. Slope. Yeah, it's, it's this, the steepness of the terrain and the irregularity of the terrain. So you can see the stone wall right here, it just about disappears in that part of the slide because you have a very steep downhill. And then on the other side over here, there's outcroppings of ledge. These dark areas are big ledgy outcroppings. So this is a site more than suitable for grazing sheep on, but not suitable for scything or growing hay. So by looking at wall construction and the lay of the land surrounding the walls, you can often start to pin down whether they were pastures, crop fields, hay fields. Now the lens cap here is um, about two inches in diameter, so a lot of the rocks in this wall are the size of large potatoes. Now, back in the uh, sheep fever craze, one of the most powerful political positions in our towns was the position of fence warden or fence viewer. A lot of our towns still have that position on the books, but those people don't have anywhere near the clout they would have had back in the early 1800s. Their major job at that time was to come unannounced to farms and walk the boundary fences to make sure they were at minimum fence height. Uh, often that was four and a half or five feet. So they would have had a staff at that length walking along, and if anywhere those boundary fences drop below that height, that was grounds for a fine. But not only that, in some towns, I've read in, in historical accounts, that the pastor would then be informed by the fence viewer or fence warden, so the next Sunday that farmer would be brought up in front of the parish. Now, there was reason for this, because in, in some Vermont towns, farms were running hundreds to thousands of sheep. And the merino is a very agile animal. If it got out of its pastures into an abutting farm's crop fields, which were usually mostly grain fields at that point in time, they could devastate those grain fields. And so this is the way it happened to be worked out around here to try to keep the peace between farms. It was the fence warden's duty to do that. Uh, and there's a lot of pressure on farmers to keep their fences up to height. Now, we don't often see the stone fences around here going up to four and a half and five feet. In some cases, you'll find them. There's some nice ones up you know, on the Putney Ridge Line in Westminster and the Pinnacle, um, where you can find stone walls getting up to about that height. But mostly you'll see that stone walls came up to waist height, because it's one thing lifting up rocks to here and then another going like this. So most of the stone fences around here probably went up to about waist height, then had cross poles and a rail to get up to that, that minimum fence height of four and a half or five feet. But I'd still like you to contemplate 
building a stone fence out of rocks the size of potatoes, even if it's only three feet high. Uh, it's not the type of material you'd probably choose to use. It's going to take a long time to work with that. It's just indicating that this fence abutted a crop field where a lot of small rock was coming out of the ground. Now, <clears throat> this slide and the next slide will finish up the agricultural segment, and then we'll go on to look at logging. Your task here is going to be to figure out what happened on the far side of the wall and what happened on the near side. I'm going to give you some additional uh, evidence to work with. The far side of the wall is about a five-acre parcel. The stone wall in the foreground wraps all around those five acres, a few breaks in the run of the wall, but you pretty much get the idea that there is once open land surrounded by a stone wall. But the critical factor here is you could walk that wall all the way around that five acre parcel, you'll never find a single small fist sized stone, not a one. So you ought to be dropping one idea of what happened over here off your list based on that. And then here's what the near side looks like. And what I want to point out here, there's a lot of rocks sticking out of the ground. And these are not big rocks. You know, rocks about the size of footballs, not huge boulders. So there's one there, one there, rock there, quartz rock there, another rock there, rock there. There's a whole much more back in here you can't see. But if you go back and wander that five acre parcel on the far side of the wall, you'll never see one rock sticking out of the ground. Not a one. So based on all this, what was the far side used for and what was the near side used for? Hay field is in pasture correct. Which, which is which? Okay, hay field on the far side, pasture on the near side. And not just pasture on the near side, heavily overgrazed and heavily eroded pasture on the near side. Now you'll notice on the far side here, the, the ground sloping down to the wall but the surface of the ground is smooth and even. Whenever we get out in woodlands around here, if we're on glacial till soils, not our outwashed sands associated with Lake Hitchcock, uh, or not our, our, our clay uh, substrates associated with the bed of Lake Hitchcock, but if we are on glacial till soils, and they're smooth and even, that means they've been plowed in the past. Because around here, um, our glacial till soils, after a couple centuries, build up a large array of what are called pits and mounds or pillows and cradles. This is the result of live trees being knocked over either by wind or snow or ice loading. And so when a live tree comes down the woods, its roots rip up out of the ground excavating what's called a pit or a cradle. And then you have the down tree and its roots sticking up in the air with all the earth that was excavated out of this pit or cradle. When those roots rot, that earth is dropped to become a mound or a pillow. So you get what's called pit and mound or pillow and cradle topography. Large features uh, of pits and mounds or pillows and cradles can be visible up to a thousand years after the event that took down a tree. Now, due to our robust nature of wind events here, both through high frequency of microbursts from thunderstorms, as well as less frequent uh, tropical storms like hurricanes, um, after a few centuries, you're going to start to build up, and also all of our ice and snowstorms, you're going to start to build up a lot of pillows and cradles. So if you go into a site with glacial till soils, and they're not there, that means they're eradicated by plowing. And of course, plowing would have occurred for one of two reasons. They would have plowed hay fields to get rid of those pillows and cradles because they get in the way of working aside. But once the hay field had been flattened out after a few plowings, it would be seeded. And if it was well cared for, it might not be plowed again. However, on crop fields, that plowing would happen annually in preparation for, for sowing seed. And so because of that, um, you wouldn't have the perennial roots and you get all the small rock coming to the surface, where in hay fields you wouldn't get much rock coming to the surface at all. And in fact, one of the things that amazed the British when they got here, their first plowings on a lot of our soils brought up very little rock. The reason is that um, thousands of years of, of soil development in our forest with critters in the soil bringing up fine materials to the surface like ants or moles or things like that, thousands of years of that activity actually sort of buried the rock in the glacial till under about a foot of fairly clean soil. So the first plowing by the British were not bringing up much rock, but on the crop fields after about a decade of work, the rock started pouring out of the ground due to the freeze and thaw activity, and they probably thought they'd sinned terribly to have that all happen at that time. But uh, I've often also thought, what would have happened if this country had been colonized from the west coast to the east coast? You know, People come into California, they get over the mountains, they get in the Great Plains, all those incredibly deep, rich soils of the unglaciated plains. And then they start working their way up into 
you know, the glaciated portions of the Northeast up into New York and then New England, I'm not sure if they would have come. You know, after being in those rock-free soils, I'm just not sure if they would have come up here. Maybe, maybe they, you know, maybe this would all be like a national park or something. I don't know. But um, in any case, uh, yeah, the rocks were something that they certainly had to deal with. Um, but in any case, yeah, the smooth, even ground here, lack of small stones means hayfield on the far side. In this side here, eroded landscape from heavy overgrazing. There's only about three ways we naturally get a lot of small rock on the surface of a forest soil. One way is if we have ledge nearby and rock cleaves off, it can migrate down. The second way is if we have saturated soils in the spring, so we get freshets running over the surface of the ground in the springtime, they can erode down exposing rock and then they dry up in the summer. Or a third way is that, you know, sometimes trees, when they get knocked over, will bring up rocks in their roots, but then the rocks will be deposited when the roots rot away on top of pillows. None of that's happening in this site. There's no ledge anywhere in here. There's no saturated soils. And the rocks are ubiquitous. They're not just on pillows, they're everywhere. So the explanation for that is, we lost soil here to expose those rocks due to overgrazing. Um, that's a lot of information to remember um, if you really want to to figure out agricultural histories in now forested landscapes. But if it's too much to remember, just take this one fact with you. The next time you're out wandering in the woods around here, if you want to impress friends and neighbors, just stop and say, you know, we're standing in a former pasture. You're going to be correct about 75% of the time. Um, but if you, want to, if you want a closer read, this is sort of the evidence you'll have to look for. Now, this was um, a clear cut right off of Interstate 91 down in Dummerston, you know, south of where the airfield is today. Um, these, these trees were probably cut back in the 80s sometime as a clear cut of white pine. And then this is what the site looked like about a decade later as the understory of maple and uh, birch were released and, and came up quite, quite nicely. My question is, if we went into this, and now the site's not there anymore because now it's a sand pit, but um, if it was still here and that forest was still there 50 years after the white pines were cut, if we walked in there, would we be able to tell it was once a white pine forest before it became a hardwood forest? Yes, that's correct. So the, yes, the correct answer is yes, and the, the evidence is yes, stump. So we're going to look at how to interpret stump decay patterns, because they're good evidence for interpreting uh, logging around here. So this is a white pine stump, and it has three features, um, well, at least one feature that all of our regional conifers share, and that is that if a conifer is sound when it's cut around here, the exception to this is northern white cedar, but we don't have much of that down here. If a conifer like a pine or a hemlock or a spruce or a fir is sound when it's cut, there's no uh, fungal infection in there, the wood decays from the outside in. They just sort of shrink in through time. Now after 30 years, they may get coated in a mat of moss, but if you're not sure, what, all you have to do is just probe through that moss. If you are going through a little bit of punky wood and you hit a hard center on a number of tries, that's a conifer, it's riding from the outside in. Secondly, our pines <clears throat> produce a tier of limbs every year, what's called a limb whirl. So if you get three or more limbs at the same height in a stump, or for that matter, the same elevation of a down log, that's telling you it's a pine. Uh, spruce and fir also do that as well, but hemlock doesn't. Hemlock, you know, the branches grow somewhat indiscriminately. And then finally, if you're lucky enough to get this red cap, British soldier-like and growing on the stump, that's also going to tell you it's a conifer. Now, I have seen... British soldier like in growing a few times on white oak stumps, but only a couple times. Every other time I've found it's been on a conifer. So I think you'd be about 95% sure if you see it growing on wood, it's evidence it's a conifer. So this pine has all three features the wood decaying from the outside in, limb whirls, and um, the British soldier lichen. Now, generally for white pine, the stumps around here will retain their bark for about 25 years, but generally after 25 years, all the bark will have been shed. And as we're going to see, this is very different from hemlock that retains its bark on the stump much longer. <clears throat> now, one reason the wood of the pine rots from the outside in can be seen in this shot. This is the heartwood here that's rather intact. The darker wood around it, the sapwood, and it's dark because it's been riddled with holes by the white pine sawyer. This is one of our native longhorn beetles. So females will seek out white pines that have been compromised to the point they can't produce sap. These could be trees that maybe got hit by a lightning strike, maybe the tops of trees taken down a logging event, or blown down trees. Uh, the females will find these trees that uh, no longer produce sap, they'll lay their eggs under the bark, 
The larvae will hatch out first eating the cambial tissue and then eventually diving down in the sapwood, eventually uh, basically tunneling, uh, making tunnels about the size and diameter of a drinking straw. So there's all these holes in the outer sapwood, it's a great avenue for fungal spores and water to get in there, so you get you know, very pronounced rates of decay in the sapwood. So that's one reason these trees are rotting from the outside in. Now, after about 35 years, the flat top of a, of a pine stump will be gone. It will have rotted down, maybe even exposing the entire limb whorl in there. So again, about 25 years to lose the bark. By about 35 years, the flat top is going to be gone. And then it's going to take generally more than 60 years to remove all the wood except for the wood associated with the limb world. So there's a limb there, a little bit of a fin of wood attached to it, another limb there, third one there, fourth one there, fifth one here. Again, to get that state of a decay in a pine is going to take about 60 years. Now, spruce decays very similar to pine. So if you get further north or further up in elevations where they're logging both spruce and pine, it can be very difficult separating those two out. But around here, <clears throat> down our lower elevations, you see things like this. It's definitely going to be white pine. For small seeded shade tolerant trees like hemlock or black birch or yellow birch or spruce, they'll seed in there, in this case a hemlock seeded in there, and then the roots will grow right down around the stump inside the bark of the tree, making a very semicircular pattern. Eventually, when the stump completely decays away, you'll see this stilted rooted tree with its roots in a semicircular pattern. Very good evidence you're looking at a tree that was nursed on a white pine stump. So that gives you some information about a previous logging. Now, as I mentioned, hemlock has wood like pine that if it's sound when it's cut, decays from the outside in. But unlike pine, it has incredibly rot-resistant bark because of all the high level of tannins that are in the bark. Uh, Hemlock actually has more tannin in its bark than any other regional tree, which is one reason why in the 1800s, people would go out in the woods around here, cut down hemlock. They weren't after the wood, they're after the bark, which would then go to the tanneries to tan leather, because those tannins would then be infused in the leather, making the leather rot resistant as well. Uh, the bark of, of hemlock is so rot resistant that after about 60 years, the wood of a hemlock stump can completely decay away, often leaving a perfectly intact ring of hemlock bark. Now, I first discovered these uh, hollowed out bark rings, again, in 1976, the year I came back to New England. I found an Aryan Putney that had been logged at four hemlock bark rings. I've visited that site every year, and three out of the four bark rings look today just the way they did back then. One now has since fallen over and is gone. Um, but I know it takes about 60 years for the wood to decay away, and now I know the bark rings can last at least another, what, 35. Uh, and I think even far longer based on this next slide. So this is a bark ring I found um, in Dummerston. And one thing I should mention, for these bark rings to persist, they have to be intact all 360 degrees around. This one is missing the side here, so it's pretty flimsy. Uh, I took this photograph in 1995. When I came back to check on this bark ring in 1996, it had been knocked over. Um, but the th interesting thing that I want you to look at here, if you look on the cut mark, you're going to see little green flecks of folios lichen colonizing the cut mark on the bark. Every bark ring in Putney I've been monitoring since 1976, none of them have that lichen growth in the bark ring. So I'm speculating it may take well over a century to leach out the tannins to make that a suitable site for lichen colonization. I, I can't prove that, but um, I'm going to keep monitoring my bark rings and after a few more years and I'm still around, I'll be able to show that they do last, at least leave evidence of a, a, a hemlock stump for at least a century. Now one of the reasons I know, yeah, thanks Alex, that, I, that it takes a hemlock stump um, to decay and weigh in 60 years is not that when I was like a baby I got a chainsaw and started cutting down hemlocks and then I've been out visiting those stumps ever since. It's from stumps like this. Uh, this is a hemlock stump that was cut. You can see the cut mark of the bark there. This up here and this over here is callus wood that's trying to heal over the wound that removed the entire tree. So this stump is alive and, and growing, albeit very slowly, and it's been growing for quite some time. So um, where is it getting its energy from to do this since it has no needles to photosynthesize with? For yeah, for a root grafting. So many of our trees growing within 10 to 15 feet of each other, their root crowns can graft right together and merge. And once that happens, then you can get carbohydrates and nutrients moving back and forth between those trees. So 
This stump was newt graft, newt root grafted onto its neighboring hemlock before it was cut, and now that graft is conducting carbohydrates to that stump, keeping it alive. Now what's marvelous about the callus wood on hemlock one is that um, the bark lays down annual growth lines on the callus wood. So each one of these parallel lines up in here, that, 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 going down, each one represents one year's worth of growth of the callus wood. So by finding stumps like this and counting back how many of those growth lines there are, uh, I can determine when the tree was logged. In this case, this hemlock was logged 43 years before the photograph was taken. And I've seen enough stumps uh, and aged them this way to know that by about 50 to 60 years, pretty much all the original wood has gone and rotted away. Now this is the only hemlock I've ever seen that completely healed over after being cut. This is actually over in the Goose Pond Preserve over in Keene, New Hampshire. My guess is the tree was probably cut about this height. It's added on about six more inches in height. Um, my guess is it was probably cut sometime back in the 1800s. Um, so the stump may be 150 years of age. Uh, if the root graft holds another 200 years, we'll have an old growth stump here. It might add on another foot in height during that time. Um, but you know, just sort of an interesting sort of feature to find out there. Now the only other tree around here that will make uh, bark rings that last after the wood decays away is the big tooth aspen. That's what this is. This is a big tooth aspen bark ring. But if you look, um, the cut on here was not done by a saw. It's sort of cut in the bias all the way around. Any guess what cut this down? Beaver, right. Now, uh, aspens are the really the high preferred winter food tree of beaver. So if you get big tooth aspens growing near beaver ponds, uh, very likely you're gonna, feed, you're gonna find uh, bark rings like this uh, in the landscape. Now, a lot of our hardwood trees, like our maples, beeches, birches, elms, have wood that rots uniformly and pretty quickly. You know, a big beech or maple stump can be gone in 35 years. But luckily, in late stages decay, uh, a lot of those hardwood species get coated in charcoal mat fungus. Um, it's just a black fungus that grows over the outer surface of the wood. Uh, it, in late stages decay, it looks like the wood may have been worked with a wood gouge, because it's sort of smooth and swoopy. And if you rub that surface, it won't blacken your fingers like charcoal. So many people will see these blackened stumps out in the woods and think, oh, there must have been a fire here. In fact, it's just the late stages of decay of trees like maples or beeches birches, elms, um, even red oak will get some on it, usually not covering it the way it does in, 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 in those other species. So that can just help identify these hardwood trees that rot more quickly. Now, many of our uh, hardwoods have the ability to stump sprout. So after being cut, their uh, epicormic buds, which are dormant in the bark, become activated and they sprout up. If those sprouts can race past the deer, uh, or moose that would browse them, then we can get a coppiced or a multiple trunk tree occurring where you have, you know, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight trunks growing out of one root system. Those also become very good evidence for interpreting uh, logging histories. So, for example, here's a, a multiple trunked red oak. Uh, has three remaining trunks, that one, that one, that one. You can see there was a trunk there, one there, one there. If you look behind this trunk, there was, there's a stump there from an, uh, uh, another trunk. And also behind this trunk, there's a stump. So looking at this trunk here, I'd just like you to focus on this. Um, this trunk was at one time surrounded by other trunks. So it's a, it's a multiple trunk tree that has an interior trunk. Whenever I see that, on a tree, that's telling me I'm looking at a tree that's been cut or heat killed by fire more than once. Because if you get a single trunk tree and you, let's say, cut it, the stump sprouts are going to grow in a radial pattern. You're not going to get anything in the middle. But if you get a multiple trunk tree and cut it, each of those trunks will stump sprout. Now you can get trunks coming up in the middle surrounded by other trunks. So looking carefully at the trunk patterns in these things, you can figure out how many times they've been cut. And then you can also estimate the age of cutting. So to do this, we'll work with this slide. But before I do that, I want to point out um, all four of these stumps have a hollow center with the most intact hardwood on the outside. That makes these four stumps one of our three species of rot-resistant hardwoods we find around here. These three species have stumps that decay in just the opposite way from conifers. Where conifers rot, the wood rots from the outside in. These stumps hollow out on the inside, leaving their hardest wood on the outside and they have stumps that will last over a century, so they can persist a long, long time. 
And the three species around here are black locust, white oak, and American chestnut. So these um, trees are either, you know, black locust, white oak, American chestnut. Now, um, what you'll notice is all four of these stumps are tipped a bit away from a large central mound. You can actually even see some moss in the back side of the mound here. And these stumps are about a foot in diameter. So what we're looking at here is a tree that was cut twice. There was once a large tree here that was cut. It's stump sprouted. Four stump sprouts made it to a foot in diameter Then when they were cut in a second cutting. And now we can figure out how big the original tree was since they grew up on the outside of the original tree. We can make a imaginary circle through the center of these stumps at ground level. And that's going to approximate the diameter at ground level of that tree. In this case, uh, you have a tree that was five and a half feet in diameter at ground level. So a very sizable tree that was cut and then stump sprouted. This is probably the most remarkable forest in terms of interpreting forest histories I've ever gone into. It's on the southeastern side of the largest black gum swamp in the Vernon, Vernon and the Maynard Miller Forest down in Vernon. So if you do the, the red trail up there, and if you do it uh, counterclockwise, you'll be going through this stand before you actually get to the swamp. So what's remarkable about the stand, you, today you walk into a forest of about a hundred year old hemlock. But all in the understory, you're going to see things like this, where you have these mounds with these hollowing out one foot diameter trees pedestaled around them. So what that means is someone at one time came in there and clear cut a forest of trees that were old growth trees, probably four to six feet in diameter. It stump sprouted, and then someone came in a second time and clear cut all the stump sprouts when they're only a foot in diameter, which is not the sort of activity you want to do if you're trying to manage a forest resource. So that can actually help us figure out what species of tree this is. So our choices again are black locust, white oak, or American chestnut. What is your guess? Chestnut. Yeah, this is chestnut. And these one foot diameter trees were salvaged when chestnut blight fungus got up in the stand. Now, the town of Vernon, when I first encountered this site in the 70s, uh, I wanted to try to figure out, okay, when did, when did this salvaging actually occur? I was getting actually good annual growth ring counts off of these stumps in 1978. They were about 40 years of age when they were cut. Um, so I wanted to figure out, okay, when were they cut? So I went to the town and they still had their tax records by perusing the tax records since everything that came off of farms in Vermont was taxed. I actually could find that in the town of Vernon, 80% uh, of the salvage and chestnut was happening in 1915. So I'm quite confident these trees were cut right around 1915. Uh, this photograph was taken in 1995, so this is representing about 80 years of decay of these one foot diameter stumps. So if those 40 year old stump sprouts were cut in 1915, it means these great big four to five and six foot American chestnuts were clear cut in 1875. And that's what makes this site so remarkable. I've never encountered, in all my wanderings, any other site in the Northeast that had evidence of an old growth chestnut forest in it. I've just never seen it. And here it was in Vernon up to 1875. So it's very, very unusual, which makes me believe that someone was protecting this stand. Now, I went after, after realizing that, I went back to the records and I looked at the deeds, and the deed name never changed. So my guess is that maybe the old man was protecting this forest passed away and then the sons wanted to cash in on this very valuable timber. That's my guess. I, I don't know that for sure, but that's a guess. Now, on this site, those chestnuts were probably 300 or more years of age when they were clear cut. So that means we're now going back into the 1500s. Um, and what's very exciting is a lot of these big chestnuts that were clear cut in 1875 were growing on top of low sloping pillows that had cradles in their southeastern side. And that's evidence of a particular type of storm with stand leveling winds coming out of the southeast. So what type of a storm would that be? Hurricane. hurricane, yeah. So now we have evidence of a hurricane happening back probably in the early 1500s or earlier. Uh, you know, the chestnut uh, could have came in there any time after the hurricane. So I, we can't tell if that hurricane was 1500s, 1400s, 1300s, but you can still see the pillows and cradles uh, left from that hurricane. Now, what's interesting, um, many trees that have nuts, studies have shown if you go out in woodlands, you'll actually, if in, the, in forests that have pillows and cradles, you'll find more nut-growing trees growing out of pillows than the more common frequent ground between them. That's the case here. A lot of these chestnuts grew out of these pillows. 
So why is that? Why are the, you know, why are the chestnuts growing out of pillows instead of the more common frequent ground between the pillows? Exactly. And, and what, what animal in particular? Yeah, gray squirrels. Uh, studies have shown that if gray squirrels have pillows and cradles in their territories, they cache more nuts and acorns and pillows than anywhere else. I've never seen the definitive reason, but I've, you know, a lot of speculations. One, it's easier to remember to go to the mounds, that's where the seeds are. Maybe it's safer for, for caching and retrieving, better visibility. Um, maybe it's drier, the, the nuts last longer. Maybe there's less snow to dig through. Maybe it's all those reasons. But the full story of this site is that somewhere in the 1500s or earlier, a hurricane hits this forest, levels trees. Eventually, pillows form. Sometime after that, a gray squirrel is inoculating the pillows with chestnuts, a number of which are not retrieved, germinate, grow up, eventually become components in the old growth forest, clear cut around 1875, that stump sprouts, then gets logged in 1915. Now, at that time, these are too small for saw timber, so they probably are going to utility poles, since electrification was coming in, or possibly even just for fencing, because if you split open chestnut before it gets any interior heart rot, um, you can get poles or rails that last centuries. So, you know, quite a remarkable story, but one that can be inferred by the evidence on site. Now, the chestnut blight was probably the single most devastating ecological event to hit the temperate deciduous forest, you know, in, in certainly recent ecological history. Um, that fungus was brought in on Japanese chestnuts that are being planted at the Bronx Zoo and Botanic Garden in 1904. Um, the Japanese chestnut and the chestnut blight had co-evolved over in Asia, so it was not lethal to those chestnuts. Uh, it would parasitize them, causing lesions, but didn't kill them. However, the American chestnut here in that fungus had never co-evolved. Co and so when the fungus escaped and started spreading through the chestnut population in the eastern half of North America, it was devastating. It only took about 30 years to march throughout the range of the chestnut and pretty much completely remove that tree from the canopy of the forest. Now, at the time that that blight came in in 1904, American chestnut was one of our most common forest trees east of the Mississippi. In places like Tennessee and Kentucky, the hardest range, many forests, one out of every two trees was American chestnut. They grew to immense size. We have photographs of chestnuts with trunk diameters up to 14 feet in diameter. Um, and that screen looks to me like it's about five or six feet, so you would have to have the width of three screens to get the, the, the diameter of a chestnut. Uh, they produce the most edible nut in North America. They're truly the signature tree of the temperate deciduous forest, and yet it took only about 30 years to remove them as a major player from that forest. We really don't completely understand how much the forest has changed because of that removal. But one thing we can be sure we've lost are remarkable den trees. Now this is a, a, a chestnut snag on my neighbor's property in Westminster. Um, this tree was obviously a pasture tree, not on a fence line, spreading limbs slowly. And actually, chestnut was a very much preferred pasture tree because during years when they're producing nuts, they would produce incredible crops growing out in the open like that. You just, you know, when the nuts are trying to come down, just remove the livestock and collect them. Um, but this tree, uh, a bear has overwintered in this tree. I've seen opossums, raccoons, northern flying squirrels roosting in this tree. Uh, I've seen chimney swifts and bats in this tree. It's a veritable ac apartment complex for wildlife. And, you know, these are wonderful because they naturally hollow out. And here it is, still standing almost a century after its demise. And that tree is still looked like this, solid. Um, and we just don't really have any other trees that service that well. As, as den trees. So that's just one of the things we lost with the demise of the chestnut. Now, we do have at least 6,000 registered American chestnuts that are resistant to the fungus. The Chestnut Foundation has done a lot of work back crossing those. Uh, I'm, so I'm confident the chestnut will come back. Um, generally, when you get a young symbiosis like this, when two species first meet, if they don't extinguish each other, natural selection starts taking over and start to force them to adjust their ecologies to be less energy wasteful. Now this wasn't just a bad interaction for the chestnut. This was bad for the fungus. If you're a, if you're a parasite, the worst thing you could do is eradicate your host. You do that, you've eradicated yourself. It's an incredibly energy wasteful thing to do. And so um, energy is a very finite resource in the natural world. Any organisms or populations that are energy wasteful gets selected out. 
any populations or organisms that are energy efficient get selected for because now they can support a larger population on the same amount of energy. So generally when you get these young symbioses, if the species do not outright extinguish each other, natural selection kicks into gear and starts forcing them to adjust their ecologies to be less energy wasteful and usually that means they're going to be less harmful. So I'm confident that Chesson will come back, it's that we're, but what we're talking about though is thousands of years. I mean, it's not, we're not going to see it coming back, but I am confident it will come back in time, as I'm confident that pretty much all of our trees that are suffering pathogens will probably make it through it and come back. But it will take thousands of years for coevolution to work those sorts of arrangements out. And it's probably unlikely chestnut will come back in the numbers that it was here originally, because uh, there's a lot of research showing that the high densities of chestnuts were related to Native American use of fire, which selected for that species. And with not really having fires in our forests anymore, we would we expect the chestnut not to be as common as it was historically. But I think I will end there and just see if there's any questions or comments people have, and then we can take those. Yeah, in the back. Bark is twisting around. It's not the bark, it's the outer heartwood that's twisting, yes. And our trees are genetically determined to twist. Um, like based on observation, I find about 90% sort of twist around to the right. This one is going to the left. Only, only, only about 10% of trees go to the left. It's sort of like right-handedness and left-handedness, I guess. It's about the same ratio in humans. But that degree of spiral is very influenced by growing conditions. So, for example, if trees really stretch out and elongate quickly, it's almost like taking a spring and pulling on that. That nature of the spiral becomes reduced. However, if they can't elongate their trunk, that spiral can be dramatically enhanced. And this is a very nice adaptation. So. Trees, let's say, growing on a windy ridge top that get wind stunted are going to have very dramatic spirals in their trunk. And of course, that makes that wood very hard to break. So it's a great thing. But open grown trees like this, pasture trees, often get distinct spirals because they haven't elongated. Or canopy suppressed trees can also get, get spiraling as well. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Can you say what would be a difference between a crop field and a hay field in terms of? Stones or terrain or yeah. Whatever. So the features to look fa look for if you're in a, if you have an area that you're, you're confident has been plowed is it smooth and even, go out to the edges, the boundaries. That's where you want to go. That's where the evidence is going to be. <clears throat> it, look for um, small stones in the walls for a crop field, or look if you're on a slope for bottom terraces, um, because on a slope farmers would plow across the slope, pushing the plow furrow down slope. So every year, soil was getting pushed down, and where the plowing stops, you get actually a terrace jutting out from the slope. So this looks different from a road cut. A road cut, you know, you'd have uh, the slope coming down, and then the road would be notched into the slope, and then the slope continuing. That's why it's called a road cut, because it's notched in there. A plow terrace, if you're on a slope, the slope comes down, and the terrace juts out from the slope. So if you have uh, a crop field, small stones in the wall, if you're on a slope, Go down the slope and see if you can find a bottom plow terrace jutting out. And also, if you have adjacent walls, see if you can find plow troughs, because they often couldn't plow right into the wall, so you get these little troughs next to the wall. Um, if you go all the way around your borders of the area, and you're not seeing any terraces, troughs, or small rocks, it's very good evidence that was solely a hay field. Anything else? This forest like when the American chestnut was here, what, what were the other species? Uh, was this a shade collar tree or was it, you know, what, what was the mix? Mm -hmm. So um, the question is, what did the forest really look like originally, maybe before the British got here? Um, the evidence from witness tree surveys, a lot of this work's been done by um, a Vermonter named Charlie Cogbill. When proprietors came up and established towns, that's in the town of Rattleboro. <coughs> they would break it up into 60 acre parcels. And the corner of each parcel on the deed, would, the corners would be denoted by what were called witness trees. So towns that still have all those original deeds, you can go back through them. And by looking, figure out, OK, what was the composition of the forest like back then? Uh, Charlie's done this through tons of towns throughout Vermont and actually throughout the whole of New England. And what he's found is that our forests were much more heterogeneous back then. Within a town, different sections of town would have very differently distinct forest types. Um, and also our forests were more structurally heterogeneous. 
uh, our landscape activities, both you know, abandonment of farmland, which trees like white pine just thrive on, um, and then following up management uh, logging activities where we're taking certain trees uh, species at much higher rates because they're more preferred, has very much homogenized our forests. Compositionally, they're much more homogeneous, and structurally they're much more homogeneous because so much of the land was all abandoned within a similar time frame. So they'd have been much more heterogeneous. Yes, in older forests, you probably would have find a lot of shade tolerant trees, but we do have a robust disturbance regime here. So we're always getting blow down, uh, snow and ice damage. Those sites would probably have trees that wouldn't have to be a shade tolerant. So we'd have, and that would add to that heterogeneity across the landscape. Yeah. Do uh, soil conditions uh, uh, affect uh, which species will come into a successor forest? Yeah, very much so. Soil conditions will affect uh, species which are said to be eco-indicators. These are species that have very, very tight conditions around soil pH, nutrients, moisture, things like that. So some very strong eco-indicators around here, let's say, of, of very calcium-rich soils would be trees like white ash, bitternut, hickory, butternut. They do really, really well in soils like that. Um, soils that do really well, let's say, on nutrient-deprived acidic dry sites, things like pitch pine, red pine, um, would be classics there. But then we do have some trees like white pine and hemlock, red maple, that are, are wonderful generalists. They can grow in just about any soil type. So we can find them growing in wetlands, swamps, to dry sites. They can be in some rich sites, poor sites. So some trees are generalists and can be found ubiquitously, but a lot of them are very site specific. Do you have a feel for, for what, when earthworms start moving into forests? Or can they provide any indication of how long agriculture areas been abandoned? Yeah. The question is about earthworms. Um, and yeah, they're not, they're not native earthworms or exotic species that came from the old world. Um, one way they got here, uh, when the British got here, one of the things that really amazed them were groves of white pine they grew in ravines of our major river systems. There were pines that were huge, you know, up seven, eight foot trunk diameters, 220, 23 feet tall. Um, they would only be found in those specific sites because they'd be tucked in the landscape. They'd grow 100 feet taller than anything else. So if they're not down in a ravine where the top of the ravine forest went up to shield their crown, they'd be very liable for lightning strike and wind throw. Well, the British coveted these pines for the mast of naval ships. They figured, golly, if we could use these trees for mass, we can make really big naval ships. So they actually developed <clears throat> special boats that would come over from London called mass boats. Uh, these boats were designed to carry 20 to 30 white pine logs up to 180 feet in length. So they had an aft that would open up so you could slide those logs in, but they're geared to take a lot of weight. So in the passage over, the hull was often filled in ballast, either in the form of rocks, if they didn't have that, then earth. And so when they came into port, the ballast was removed, piled up on the harbor side of his earth. In it were earthworms and a lot of seeds of like those plants like basil rosettes that moved in. Um, so yes, um, they're, they're here as an exotic. And I imagine you could probably use them to age abandonment of sites. But I don't, I'm not an expert on that and don't know about that. Um, but you could possibly do that because they are going to be more common in agricultural soils than intact forest soils. Although now they are spreading, and um, that will be a new concern we'll have to worry about here. Um, there are some species of earthworms that really can restructure the forest floor. Uh, they can remove uh, basically leaf litter. They can affect mycorrhizal populations. So they allow uh, exotic species of plants to move in. So that's, that's a, a new concern we're having to worry about here, which you know, it's been something fairly recent. That's been a big problem out in the Midwest, but we're now starting to see it in sites here in New England as well. Anything else? Sure. I've actually been thinking about the earthworm issue recently, um, and what I have no idea of is, do we know how they changed the ecology of the soil? Do we know if, they, if they've replaced other, other subsoil macroinvertebrates or just change things completely? Yeah, there's a lot of <clears throat> research coming out of the Lake States, Western New York, where they've been studying this now for about 20 years, and they're definitely seeing dramatic changes in, in soil communities. 
around fungi, around invertebrates, around a lot of stuff. So they do have some pretty sizable impacts. Yeah. We're kind of energy wasteful ourselves, so what do you think about natural selection versus humans versus the forest? <laughs> um, I think we're going to be selected upon as well. Yes, we are energy wasteful, and uh, we're going to have to learn how to be much more energy frugal. Um, uh, you know, whenever you use energy, you create entropy in the biosphere. Entropy means you're disorganizing the biosphere, you're simplifying it. So um, we're doing that. And that's just not like a benign thing. That feeds back. So, you know, um, climate change would be the result, an entropic result, of burning a lot of fossil fuels. Um, we can start to see what climate change is doing. Now, can we say this is due to climate change, that we had in Vermont this year two record level floods, one in the spring, one in the fall? Um, I mean, you're talking now about something like at least two, three hundred year flood events both happening within five months of each other. Um, is that related to climate change? I don't think we can definitively say that, but if that pretends what the future is going to be, um, that's going to be huge because you can see the economic cost of that. And eventually, if we start really getting multiple events like this, and of course this year, the amount of money that has gone out to, to disasters has dwarfed any other year because we started with those tornado swarms uh, in March, then the massive flooding of both the Mississippi and the Missouri rivers in the summer, the unprecedented fires happening in the southwest from Arizona through New Mexico and the Texas, and then these dramatic flood events up here. Um, it's been a huge dramatic year around weather-related catastrophes. And if that is the future, if we're on the cusp of it, that is going to curtail a lot of what we're doing, and we will have to be reducing energy consumption. Would it be a choice? It'll be just sort of forced upon us. So, um, yeah, this is something we have to be very aware of and very serious about. Um, well, great places to go. I mean, <clears throat> uh, you know, the, the Windmill Hill Pinnacle Association has preserved an incredible amount of land uh, you know, stretching from Athens down into Putney. Putney Mountain Association has land there as well. That whole ridge line is just laced with um, all sorts of settlement patterns. I mean, there, that was really the, the core of early settlement around here. When the, the, the British first came in, they were settling up on the ridge tops, like Chesterfield is still today, because, um, you know, there was fear about Native American raiding parties. There was even fear about malaria. So there's a wealth of stuff up on that ridge line. You know, so just ample trails to walk on and, and lots and lots to see up there. So that's a great place to go. Putney Mountain? Yeah, Putney Mountain or even further north into the Windmill Hill and Pinnacle Lands. And they have beautiful maps of all the trails uh, if at the Windmill Hill and Pinnacle Association so you can get maps. And, you know, there's just tons of opportunities up there. I was going to say, it's been probably 25 years since I've been to the Black Gum Swamp uh -huh. and yeah. Well, the Black Gum Swamp's a great place to go. <clears throat> it only has a few years left. Those chestnut stumps are now really starting to fall down. And probably 10 years from now, the history of that site will, have, will start to disappear. Um, because that picture was taken in 95, and even you know, in the last 16 years, those stumps are really starting to break up now. All right, well, thank you very much.